Corinthians chapter number 4. Uh, we finished chapter 3. We, we covered a lot of ground. We looked at verses uh, 6 to 18. And of course, we didn't cover every detail. We could easily go back and spend several weeks on it. But I think we got the main point across as what the passage is about. For an example, I could spend a long time just on verse 18. That's one of those great verses on how we can have real and lasting change in our life. It's not by introspection and self-discipline. It's rather by focusing on the Lord and letting His Spirit change us as we spend time in His Word. <laughs> and it's a tremendous verse. And if I were just doing a message, a topical message, I could do a whole message easily on verse 18. But we're going to go on in chapter 4. Our goal when we go verse by verse is to just get a basic understanding of each passage. Um, you know, and if we were to look at every detail, we could literally teach one book of the Bible for years. I mean, that's how rich the Word of God is. But I do remind you that what we looked at last time in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul contrasted law and grace to show how superior his ministry was to the legalists who were attacking him. And now as we come into chapter 4, he explains how it is that in spite of all the suffering and trouble he faced in the ministry, he didn't faint. <laughs> he said, we faint not. In other words, we don't quit. We don't give up. Notice verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not. And then look at verse 16 at the end of the chapter. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. In the book of Proverbs it says, If thou faintest in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Paul said, A great and effectual door is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Well, in the ministry, there's going to be adversity. And if you faint, it's because your strength is small. That's why Paul said, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And uh, he said, our sufficiency is of God. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5. So, uh, Paul's going to talk to us about how we can keep going as we do the work of the ministry. People quit because they're, they're depending on themselves instead of the Lord. The Lord can give you all that you need to carry on if we learn to trust Him each and every day and walk by faith in what we have in Him. Everything we need is in the Lord. And we can say like Paul, by the grace of God, I finished my course. Anybody can start out. How many people start out to serve God? But who finishes? <laughs> That's the question. And we can, by the grace of God. Um... The good news is, is even if we get off course, and we all do from time to time, we can get back on. Just keep going. Let's not faint. Verse 1 again. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. So, therefore, on the basis of what was just said in chapter 3. This ministry is the ministry he was talking about in chapter 3. You remember he said in chapter 3, verse 6, who, hath, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. This ministry of the Lord, that what God is doing in this age. And um, I like how Paul said in Acts 20, uh, when he's talking to the Ephesian elders about his ministry, he makes this statement in Acts 20 verse 24. But none of these things move me. All the... Suffering, all the persecution, all the trouble. So it does not move me away from what I'm supposed to do. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. He was ready to lay his life down for the cause of Christ. So that I might finish my course with joy. And by the way, not just finish, finish with joy. Some people just barely make it across the line, bitter and defeated and... No, he said, I, finish with, I want to finish with joy and victory. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. What ministry is that? 
to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of our sins. He was buried, but on the third day He rose again in victory. If we put our trust in Him, we're saved totally by grace, through faith, plus nothing. It's on the basis of the blood of the New Testament. Okay? So He received this ministry of the Lord. And He wants to finish it. And so, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. And by the way... Uh, he says in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians in verse number 18, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Through the death of Christ, sinners are reconciled to God. This ministry of reconciliation. So you start thinking about the ministry. Of course, there are many verses to look at on that. What a great privilege. But yet, what a great responsibility. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. You know, we can't preach about God's mercy to sinners if we've not first received it ourselves. He said, we've received God's mercy. I think about what he said in 1 Timothy 1 about his salvation. 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 Well, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. See, that's how Paul can do what he did. It's not about Paul as a man. It's about the Lord enabling him. God being his sufficiency. For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. And injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord is exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So he goes forth preaching what he himself has received and what's real to him. And he's that pattern. You know, not only that, in terms of we've received mercy and salvation, of course, God's grace. He's giving us what we don't deserve. God's mercy, He's not giving us what we do deserve. Mercy and grace. We need mercy and grace not only for salvation, but also in serving the Lord. Remember how He started out this epistle back in chapter 1, verse 3? Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He has all the mercies we need. As we serve Him. Um, he mentioned in 1 Corinthians 7.25 that He said, As one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. It was God's mercy. And He talks a lot about grace, not only for salvation, but in service. His, Christ said, My grace is sufficient for thee. And uh, there are verses where Paul talks about grace in terms of how we serve the Lord. The bottom line is, God is all we need. He has all we need, if, but we got to receive it. Notice he said, we have received mercy. See, there are things there. But how do you receive the things of the Lord? You do it by faith. You do it by trusting in Him. Verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So evidently, there were some at Corinth, and we've already talked about this in our study, but there were some there who accused Paul of these things in the verse, saying, well, he's dishonest. He's walking in craftiness. He's handling the Word of God deceitfully. You remember back in chapter 1, verse 17, he answers 
things that were being said. He said, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness or the things that I purpose? Do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. Somebody's saying that about him and he's having to answer that. So they attack even his motives. They're saying there's, a, there's hidden things of dishonesty there. That's why in the next chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, you know what the whole chapter's about? The right motives in serving the Lord. Paul's going to show what his motives are through chapter 5. And so he's saying, look, no, this is not us. We've renounced that. We've renounced. That's the only mention of the word renounced in the Bible. King James Bible, it means disowned. We've denied it. We've rejected it. That's not us at all. On the contrary, it's by manifestation of the truth. Committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul preached to make the truth manifest. Back in chapter 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. He meant what he said. He spoke plainly. When you left from hearing Paul, you didn't have to wonder, now I wonder what he was talking about. I wonder what he really meant. Well, no, we, we say what we mean and we mean what we say. And if you're going to preach, you need to preach with great plainness of speech. I don't like people preaching with an enigma where they make this abstract word picture and you've got to figure out what in the world they're talking about. Just, just preach it like it's written. This book is plainly written. <laughs> Have you ever read it? We use great plainness. He said, I want to make it manifest. And, 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 and I'm being honest with this. He said, um, in fact, I, I thought about what he said in um, Titus chapter 1 verse 3 when he said, but um, hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. Manifested His Word through preaching. God chose the foolishness of preaching. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 1. You say, oh, you're kind of foolish how you preach. I'm, hey, thank you. God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's what God uses. You better get on the same page with God. And so, this is what he does. He said, I'm, he manifested his word through preaching. Now, to make that manifest, his message commended him in the conscience of those who heard him in the sight of God. Notice how he says, in the sight of God. He's always talking like that. Hey, I'm not hiding anything. I say, this is in the sight of God. God knows my heart. God knows what's going on here. And these people have heard me preach. There's something there in their conscience that that issue of conscience knowing right from wrong. Now it's possible to sear your conscience. So trust God's word, not just your conscience. But someone whose conscience is operating correctly. Paul said, you know I'm telling you the truth. He, met, he wanted it manifest. And when he said commending ourselves to every man's conscience... I think that harkens back to chapter 3, verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? No, we don't need that. God commends us. And uh, when I'm preaching, it ought to be commended in your conscience. I don't need a letter from someone to validate what I'm doing. That's what he's saying. Now, notice in verse 2 the satanic approach to the Scriptures. You know, there is, a, there is such a thing. You know, Satan, he likes to mess with the Word of God. He likes to quote Scripture. People think the devil's out there on a street corner somewhere trying to get someone to, to buy drugs, you know. That's just people's flesh. The devil is the God of this world. He's in religion. He says God of this world in verse 4. He likes to handle the Scriptures <laughs> deceitfully. The satanic approach to the Scripture is, and, and he uses men to do it, 
the hidden things of dishonesty, that's got to do with the motive. Walking in craftiness, that's the manner. And then handling the Word of God deceitfully is the method. You can remember that. The motive of these guys is hypocrisy. They're, they're hypocrites. In other words, they're hiding, they're dishonest on the inside, but they're trying to come across so righteous on the outside. Just like the Pharisees, pretending to be something you're not. And their manner is, they walk. How do they live? Everything's crafty. You know, they, they, they are deceptive in how they operate. And when they take the Word of God, they handle it deceitfully. So they handle the Word of God. Now, hold a marker there and look over in chapter 11. The satanic approach to the Scripture. And if you will discern this, what you're going to find is that this is the, what, this is the approach to Scripture in most churches today. Sadly. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent, and that's the devil there, the old serpent, beguiled Eve, how? Through his subtlety. Very crafty. Underhanded. So your minds, now there's the battlefield. Your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. So there are people coming into Corinth preaching another Jesus. I submit to you that the Jesus in most people's imagination doesn't line up with the one in this Bible. Men get up and they preach another Jesus. And how do you know the difference? Spiritual discernment from the Word of God. If, you're, if, you're, if you know Christ of the Bible, you'll recognize when someone's preaching another Jesus. He said, Whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, so this is counterfeit. The devil likes to operate in counterfeit. Another spirit. Boy, there's, there's a counterfeit Holy Spirit work, and it's actually seducing spirits, masquerading as the Holy Spirit. These churches that say, boy, the Spirit really moved. I say, which one? <laughs> so as I felt something, it was just, boy, I tell you, was, the Spirit was moving. And I don't doubt that there's something going on, but you need to discern if it's the Spirit of God or a seducing spirit. Which you have not received, or another gospel. Boy, is there ever people preaching another gospel. Counterfeit. Which you have not accepted. You might well bear with them. And if you skip down to verse number uh, 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Boy, that's very important to note. That's how he, when he came in that garden to that woman, he didn't appear as a hideous monster that wanted to destroy her. I mean, he was like an angel of light to her. That's deception. He said, therefore, it's no great thing, verse 15, if his minister, his ministers, whose ministers? Does God have ministers? Yes, He does. Well, guess who also has ministers? Satan always opposes what God is doing. And, he, and it's in accordance with what God is doing. So he's going to have these counterfeit ministers. That He said, if they be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They appear as ministers of righteousness, but they're, they are, there's hidden things of dishonesty going on there. So, this satanic approach to the Scripture. Paul said um, about the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 4, I'll mention to you, he talked about at the judgment seat of Christ, when the Lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, comma, what is he talking about? And will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. What's really going on in the heart there? God knows. God knows. The Lord knows the hearts. 
He tries the hearts. So there are people that are, they have these hidden things of dishonesty. Paul said, not us, we renounce that. We don't walk in craftiness. You know what craftiness is. I mean, in fact, in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4 verse 14, he said um, that we, I'll give you a moment, sometimes I get ahead, I know. Ephesians 4 14. How we need to grow spiritually unto a perfect man, the unity of the faith, all of that. Well, you need to grow because he said in verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. It's like a magician, you know, the slight of hand. And cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Paul said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual wickedness in high places. But there, how do evil spirits speak today? Through men. How does the Holy Spirit speak today? Through men. The Holy Spirit's not floating around in here whispering in your ear. And evil spirits aren't floating around in here whispering in your ear. The way it works is God's preachers get up and preach the Word of God. And the Spirit of God uses that. Well, Satan's preachers get up and handle the Word of God deceitfully and they use that. You've got to discern these things. Handling the Word of God deceitfully. I mean, that's, that's their method with the Scripture. In fact, you recall in chapter 2 verse 17... Paul said this, he said, we are not as many, <laughs> okay? This is what he said, we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. How much more are they doing it today? They corrupt the Word of God. He said, not us, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So there are men that are corrupting the Word of God. And they handle it deceitfully. The devil's way is not to get rid of the Bible. He's too smart for that. His way is to corrupt it and handle it deceitfully. And a lot of people can't discern it. Because they're not grounded in the truth. Uh, how, do you, how do you corrupt the Word of God? You add to it, you take from it, you change it, right? How do you handle it deceitfully? You take it out of context, you don't rightly divide it, you misapply it. I mean, for an example, in that, I talked about seducing spirits. 1 Timothy 4, uh, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, example. What is a doctrine of devils? Commanding to abstain from meats. Hold the phone. <laughs> Nobody holds the phone anymore, I guess, you know. That's when you'd put it, you know. <laughs> uh, didn't God command His people to abstain from meats? Didn't in time pass under the law. But to bring that over under grace and say, you're not right with God unless you keep the dietary law becomes a doctrine of devils. So what that illustrates is the devil will use the Word of God against you. He will twist it and rest it. Peter talked about those who rest it to their own destruction. Um, I preached not long ago on this very thing in Luke chapter 4, if you recall, on the contrast between Satan and Jesus Christ on how they approach the Word of God. You have an illustration right there where the devil comes tempting Christ and has the audacity to corrupt the Word of God. He quotes from the Psalms, omitting words, changing words, like the Lord doesn't know that. He is the Word of God. If He's going to do that to Jesus Christ, what's He going to do to people who don't even read their Bible? And then He misapplied the prophecy. He was handling it deceitfully. What did Christ do? He believed the words. He honored the words. He went in the synagogue and talked about the Scriptures that they had in their hands. 
He believed the words. And he, what did he do? He rightly divided the word of truth. He quit reading in the middle of the sentence because he was rightly dividing his first advent from his second advent in that prophecy in Isaiah. Christ was showing he's a dispensationalist. That makes sense since dispensation is a Bible word and God tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. So, all right, of all the people out there today with a Bible, standing up like I am tonight, trying to preach, and that's usually what I do, try, <laughs> people are adding, removing, changing, taking it out of context, not rightly dividing it. That's the satanic approach. But what are we to do? Believe the words. Believe the words. Rightly divide the word of truth. You see, when he said handling the word of God deceitfully, that's in contrast with 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so you need to spot, you need to be able to discern everybody you're listening to. Discernment. The spiritual man judgeth all things. Okay, And you can't just, so many people, let's just be honest, so many people, if a guy sounds good, <laughs> they believe what he's saying. He sounds sincere, he sounds positive and nice, yeah, I'm sure. Didn't you ever read where Paul said these false teachers use good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple? What do you think deception is? It is... I mean, the classic illustration, I hate to keep using but I can't help it. It's a classic illustration. is Joel Osteen. The people think he's the nicest man in the world. He is a devil. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mark them, Paul said. I ought to name people more than I do, if anything. You, you, they sound sweet. They look good. All that stuff. You know, they come across so nice and oh, so smooth. You know, but what are they saying? What is the message? You know what his message is? Believe in yourself. Look to yourself. Love yourself. All that stuff. How about this? Die to yourself. <laughs> Crucified with Christ. Um, verse 3. Let's read verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You notice he said, but, in verse 3, so he's obviously, you know, thinking about what he just said in verse 2 about by manifestation of the truth. But even though that's what he's endeavoring to do, it's hid. There are some people who just don't see it. He said, Paul says, because they're lost. Because they believe not. If Paul's gospel, and notice he said, if our gospel be hid. Obviously he's talking about salvation by grace through faith alone, not of works, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If that's not manifest to people who hear it, it's because they're lost. It's hid from them. And why is it hid from them? He said in verse 4, which believe not. Now listen, Satan can't make someone stay blinded. When people won't believe the word of God, they open their mind to the devil. You've got no vacuum to hang out in, my friend. You either believe God or the devil. If you won't believe the true gospel, old Satan's got one there for you. Now, how can people not see the bright light of the glorious gospel of Christ? I mean, go back to chapter 3 and let's read a little bit again to remind ourselves. I mean, this is all in the same context here. He's talking about the glory and the light. Now, he was talking about that in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 6, who, hath also, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, talk about the law. There was a glory there to the law. 
so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Talking about Paul's message and the Spirit of God using the gospel of the grace of God to bring salvation, the glory of this message, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For that which is done away was glory, if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Think of the glory. He, Paul called it the glorious gospel of Christ. The glorious gospel. I mean, it's a bright shining light. And people don't see it. It's hid from them. How? Why? Because Satan is very real. And he is the prince of this world. Jesus called him that a number of times. So he's operating in the politics. You can count on that. But he's not just in that realm. He is the God of this world. That's your religion right there. The God of this world. He's the God of this world because as Paul said in Ephesians 2, in verse 2, he said, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. And Paul called it a present evil world. According to the prince of the power of the air. There's Satan. The now listen to this. This is scary. This is scary stuff, man. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Amen. You're, when you're, look, look, in this world, you got people, man, they're filled with the devil. In their mind, their mind is operating by a satanic viewpoint. He's working on those minds. It's all about the mind. That's the battlefield. It's, he's working in them. The spirit is connected with the mind. This, uh, you know, he, he can't read your mind. He's not omniscient, you know. But he can sure try to influence your mind. And he does, he's very successful in what he, what he does. So he is uh, the, the God of this world. So what is he doing? Well, he, he works... Okay, all right, let's ask ourselves this. What is God doing today? I mean, it's a very simple question. It's a very simple question, unfortunately, a lot of churches can't answer. They think, well, he's building gymnasiums and... <laughs> no, what is God doing today? He will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So what do you think old devil wants to do? How about keep people blinded to the gospel and blinded to the truth? <laughs> So what does he do? He's working to blind the minds of the lost and he's working to corrupt the minds of the saved. Paul, remember 2 Corinthians 11.3. Lest your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And what that has to do with you're complete in him. But when you get your confidence in yourself and not in Christ, Christ is our life. But when we, but when we begin to put confidence in ourselves to live the Christian life, we've, we, we've put our confidence in the wrong place and we get corrupted away. And that's what legalism is. Performance of the flesh, right? I'm going to make this statement. I've made it before. I'm going to make it again. A lot of people don't believe it, but it's true that all religion today is of the devil. All of it. But see, God gave a religion to Israel. They corrupted it with their tradition. He moved away from the, the concept of religion altogether in this age. He will return a pure religion to Israel under the new covenant. But the only thing Paul said about religion was negative. He talked about what he was for his saved. And religion is all about the outward observances and what we do in performance. But really what it is about today is who we are in Christ the moment we believe the gospel. And... I don't care whether, I mean, and you start talking about religion, boy, that's a, that's a big category. You know what they all have in common? I don't care what one you're talking about. All religion has this in common. you got to perform. You want to be saved? You want to stay saved? You want to, it's up to you what you're, what you're going to do. And it's all works-based, right? Now, 
uh, how, if he blinds the minds of them which believe not, how, how does he do that? He does not do that by getting rid of the gospel. He does it by counterfeiting the gospel. That's how he does it. And so the issue is, look, Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, he said, But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down what? Imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So that's the issue. We'll get to that passage later. But I'm saying the battlefield is the mind. And so he, as long as he can keep religious people thinking they can earn it, <laughs> they're never going to turn to Christ. The religious world is blinded to the fact that the glory of the law has been done away and abolished. Look in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 13. 2 Corinthians 3.13, Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. That glory faded. It, it's done away. It's abolished. But people are blinded. They think it's still there. They think there's a glory in the law to perform the law and make your way to heaven. He said, but their minds were blinded. You see? Their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. It reminds me of what Paul said in Romans 10 about Israel, but it's still true of all religion. Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. If you think you can, do, if you think you can be righteous by the works of the law, you're not going to trust the righteousness of Christ. But he said that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You're righteous in Christ the moment you believe. But the religious world is blinded they don't realize the glory of the law has been done away and abolished. They think there's still a glory there they can achieve. But here's the bottom line of it. How do you spot a counterfeit gospel? And look, it can get real deceptive in that there are people who talk about Jesus Christ. He died on the cross, you know, rose from the dead. You say, boy, he talks about death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, is that all? Listen carefully. And what they'll do is they'll put some works in there. Any, to add any human works to the gospel. And I don't care what it is. It may be something big or small. If they say you've got to believe Jesus died rose, and rose again and then wiggle your little finger, you'll be saved. It's, wiggling that little finger is the wrong deal. And when you add something you've got to do to it, you, what have you done? Perverted the gospel of Christ. Galatians 1, verse 6 to 12, Paul deals with that. He said, let them be accursed. Now, some people are just blatantly preaching a false gospel. and You don't have to have hardly any sense to see it. But there are some people, man, they get right up close to that, to the truth, and they, that little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, notice, he said, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are unchurched. I'm sorry. No, that's not what he said. I'm not trying to get him by a church. I'm trying to get the law saved. <laughs> Lost. What a term, by the way. Without Christ, people are lost. That's a real scary. I mean, do you want, uh, have you ever been lost before? <laughs> Can you imagine being. Look, what about lost for eternity without God? I mean, just, this is a serious thing. He said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Well, let me, let me just say this real quick, make a point. Um, if there are not different gospel messages in the Bible. Now, there's only one by which you're saved today, but, but there's more than one in the Bible, right, in different ages. If they're not different gospels, then what you have is you have the apostles being lost while they're preaching the gospel in the earthly ministry of Christ. Because what did Jesus say? 
to them in Luke 18 at the end of his ministry. I'm going to die, be buried, and rise again. What does it say? It was hid from them. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was hid from them. That's the gospel Paul preached. How Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And they were preaching a gospel message. But Paul's gospel was hid from them. Does that mean they were lost? No, because it wasn't revealed yet. They couldn't have known it yet. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. See? So there's so many ways to prove there's more than one gospel message in the Bible if you're honest with the scriptures. And then he said here in verse number um, 4 at the end of the verse, who is the image of God? Christ, the image of God. Uh, and there's a number of verses on that. In Philippians, it talks about how he's the, uh, he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He is the bodily image of the invisible God. God is the spirit. But it says in Colossians 1.15 that Christ is the image of the invisible God. It says in Colossians 2.9 that in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And Hebrews 1.3, He's the express image of His person. Christ, the image of God. He is God. And the light of that, that glory. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment down in verse 6. Look at verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. I love that statement. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Those who preach themselves instead of Christ Jesus the Lord are helping Satan blind the lost to the gospel. How are people going to get saved if all the preacher does is talk about himself? Who do we need to be talking about? Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Preach the Word. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1.19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. Paul preached Christ. He preached Christ crucified. He preached Christ risen from the dead. He preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He preached Christ. You preach Christ by preaching the Word of God. I'm not saying a man can't use an illustration here or there, but you listen to the average sermon and, and, you'll, and you'll quickly see most preachers are preaching themselves. You walk away learning more about the preacher than you do about the Lord. Now here's the thing. Servants don't talk about themselves too much, do they? You listen to a man, he's always telling you about himself and how much Bible he knows and how much he prays and how much he does this and how much he does that. I don't like stuff like that. I pick up on that pretty quick. That bothers me. There's too much of that. You got to watch it. Gl glory goes to God. Preach the word. I don't care if you read 100 chapters a day. What do I care? What does that mean to me? Nothing. And you might as well quit. It's not doing you any good because you're so cocky about it, right? It's not about what we do, it's about who He is and what He's done for us. Now, here's the thing about legalists what do they do? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest what? Any man should boast. What do legalists do? Boy, I tell you, I joined the church, got baptized, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I. When you ask someone if they're saved, and they start telling you what they've done, boy, that's a bad sign, isn't it? That means they, what are they, what are they trusting in? And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. When you ask me, are you saved? I'm going to say yes. You're going to say, how do you know? I say, Jesus Christ died for me. I'm trusting what he did for me. It's not about what I do for him. We preach not ourselves. Verse 6, and we'll finish with verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts... To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, what, Paul, what is he doing here? He's using Genesis 1, verse 1 to 3, as a picture of salvation. You know what that says, don't you? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, 
Let there be light. And there was light. Now, how could that be a picture of salvation if there's not a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? In other words, something happened between verse 1 and 2. It's the fall of Lucifer. And verse 2 is describing judgment because of his rebellion. If that's not the case... And by the way, it doesn't matter how long the gap was. We're not trying to put evolution in there. We just preached last Sunday against evolution. We don't believe evolution. But what we're saying is God didn't state right there what happened. He put it in other passages. You've got to search the Scriptures. There are all kind of gaps in the Bible where you've got to fill in by searching other Scriptures. But what I know is Genesis 1-2 is a description of judgment. I know that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's, that's something happened in there, and that what happened was the fall of Lucifer and God's judgment on it. So how, would, how could this be a picture of salvation if there's no fallen judgment there? Here's the thing. God created man innocent. God created man upright. Man fell. Adam was created in the image of God. We're born in the image of Adam. Right? That's what it says, that Seth was born in the image of Adam, right? Marred, we need to be renewed in the, in the image, Colossians says. We need to be made a new creature. How about this? We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works. We are created in Christ Jesus. So what you have in Genesis 1 is you have a creation, you have a judgment, and then you have a, a new creation, right? God reconstructing. And those six days or literal days happened about 6,000 years ago. But here's the point. This picture Paul is using here wouldn't make sense if there wasn't a fallen judgment back there. Now, I love that because when you look at it, I've had people say, well, I don't believe in the gap theory. I said, well, Paul did. <laughs> Seems like he would know since he wrote the Word of God. <laughs> Why he couldn't use this as a picture if there was if that anyway that's not my subject that's not my subject here's my subject the earth was without form and void and darkness right you know what that is that's a picture of the human heart I'm talking about void it's about darkness but the spirit of God moves <laughs> and then God speaks. He uses His Word. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God. And God says, let there be light. And He brings you out of darkness into light. And then what did He do? He separated the light from the darkness. He separates you out. He brings you out of darkness. He brings you into the light. And we are created in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God moves. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God. God speaks. You're saved by faith. What is faith? Believing what God said. You believe the gospel, the Spirit of God regenerates you, baptizes you, seals you. The moment you believe, what a wonderful truth. That, you're talking about the power of God, by the way. You're talking about the Word of God. He created all things by His Word. He upholds all things by His Word. That same God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness can shine in the darkness of our hearts. And He gives us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hey, I'm talking about something real. I'm not talking about religion. You got people that go to church and they go through the motions and there's nothing there. Have you ever been brought out of darkness into light? I don't know. Well, it's kind of something you know. <laughs> I like that old man in John 9. I, hey, this is what I know. I was blind and now I see. I know that. I can't explain it all. And if you would ask me when I got saved, explain to me propitiation and the difference between justification, sanctification, and glorification. You know, I'd be like, what? What I do know is I was blind and now I see. <laughs> you believe the gospel. He brings you out of darkness into the light. But now you need to learn to walk in the light and grow in the knowledge of God. Because even a believer can still be blind to some, to some truth if he yields to the flesh and yields to the devil's lies. 
But this conflict, you know what the real conflict is? It's not Republican, Democrat. That's not the real conflict. It's not, it's not white and black. That's not the real conflict. The real conflict is light versus darkness, good versus evil, God versus Satan. And, and we're always getting distracted with all these other conflicts. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We've got to look beyond that. Who's really operating here? What's really going on here? Well, I'll finish tonight with this statement. He said, what does he do? He, he gives the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, again, the context. That's in contrast with the face of Moses. You know, Moses came down. He had been talking with God, getting the law. His face was bright. And uh, they put a veil over his face because it's the brightness of that glory. Well, I guarantee you this. Whatever that was, it was nothing compared to the light that's in the face of Jesus Christ. His, light, the, his face is, like the, is brighter than the sun. It, it, it's so bright, when he appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he was blinded. And, and Paul said, he's dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. You can't in your flesh be in the brightness of his glory. It'd kill you. Just like that. That's why we need a new body. A glorified body. If we're going to dwell in His presence. You want to know how bright the glory... Jesus Christ is the glory of God. See, in this context, He's been talking about the glory. You had the glory of the law because that's the Word of God. And it's God's standard of righteousness and so forth. But, but Jesus Christ is God and He makes us righteous. And when you begin to get into the glory of what Paul preached, what was revealed to him, there's no comparison. He said, this glory far excelleth the excellency of the knowledge. Do you know how bright the glory of Jesus Christ is? In Revelation 21, talking about that New Jerusalem, that's a pretty big city. It's 1,400 miles square. That's, 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 I mean, in other words, even high. I mean, 1,400 miles. This is huge, right? He said there's no need for the sun. There's no need for the moon. There, who's going to light up the city? Jesus Christ. Let me read the verse to you. We'll finish. I, gotta, I get a kick out of this because I think about, in my mind, I think about this city with all the stones. All the beautiful stones. And I feel sorry for some of my brethren who are not even going to get to look at it because they're so dispensational. <laughs> they're going to miss it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm, I'm going in the thing. I'm just going in it because the Bible said if your name's in the book of life, you get to go in. Now, some of these guys, their names are not in the book of life, so they don't get to go in. They'll tell you it's not in the book. <laughs> So whatever, <laughs> they're going to be floating around somewhere in space, you know. I'm so super spiritual, all I could do is float around out here. How do you not have access to the throne of God? Where is His throne going to be? In that city. Amen. Now, again, you don't have to tell me about the 12, 12, 12, 12, and the 12 try. I know all that. I'm just saying I get to go in anyway. How about that? Because you know what? He's going to gather together all things. Heaven and earth, where? In Christ. He said in Revelation 21, 23, The city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. He's the glory of God. He lights up the whole city. And remember when God said, Let there be light? That was before He put the sun in the sky. The light comes from Him. But... When that city with all its stones and all of its beauty is lit up with the glory of God, I can't wait to see it. I'm going fishing in the river of life. <laughs> Stuff like that gets people so mad. I know some guys, they're stripping the gear right now. And they, Oh, Lord. But I enjoy just kind of aggravating people sometimes just a little bit. <laughs> no, but seriously, seriously, look, we're, we're, I can't fully grasp all we get to do and all we get to see and all we get to experience, but that's going to be part of it. The glory of God. You can behold with open face the glory of the Lord. That's a lot better than what they had under the law. <laughs> a lot better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the.